Good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, and this is the podcast Life Along the Merrimack on 96.3 radio and local cable channel nine. We meet weekly at two o'clock and we talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River. And I recently wrote a book titled um, Merrimack, the Resilient River, a illustrated profile of the most historic river in New England. And so some of these slides that I want to show today are about the Merrimack. And I chose them in part to answer some questions. I speak before library groups and um, school groups about the Merrimack, and there are frequently questions. And by now, I know a lot of the answers. Um, so as I go along, I'm going to be responding to questions that I have received in the field. Now, here is a beautiful photograph of the harbor in Newburyport. And someone asked, how many vessels are there each summer? On the Newburyport side, there are about 1,500 vessels, either in the yacht clubs, on the slips, or on moorings. On the other side, including Salisbury and Amesbury, there are about 500. So each summer there are close to 2,000 vessels. And this has come year by year an increase. In fact, there are no slips open this summer at all, even if you wanted to have one. It's come because the river has gotten cleaner. Now, sometimes it gets dirty and we can talk about that. But since 1972, when the Clean Water Act was passed by the federal government, the river has gotten cleaner. And so it's brought more um, vessels, people fish, people use um, motorboats, they do jet skis, they sail. A cleaner river has been a good thing for the Merrimack. On the left is uh, part of the Great Marsh and Newburyport and the whole uh, Merrimack area has the largest marsh north of New Jersey. So meaning, it's the largest in New England. And this is very helpful, of course, for insects, for birds, for fish. And so you can see a lot of marsh there. And of course, there's some marsh to the right in front of Plum Island. But we always got to remember that the marsh is a terrific asset for this area. People ask if they're still fishing. And here's a slide of several fishing boats. Fishing has diminished greatly. There may be eight to 10 uh, commercial fishing boats in port each summer. Of course, a century and a half ago, there were hundreds of vessels just in Newburyport. Many young men took to the field. It was easy to learn, but it was very, very dangerous. In fact, people still talk about the uh, New England gale. And that occurred in 1952, uh, 1852. Hundreds of vessels from, um, say, Boston all the way up to Portland and the Maritimes were out on a given day in the fall of 1852. A huge gale came up, uh, unbeknownst to any of the sailors. And of the hundreds of boats out on the water, 92 of them were lost and 24 of them were from Newburyport. So again, 1852, the Yankee Gale, it was a long time ago, but it does reflect the fact that fishing was a very dangerous occupation. And here are a couple of vessels that still fish. There are many federal, federal regulations. You can't catch too much of this or too much of that. Um, you may have heard that, but here is Newburyport and here, couple of fishing vessels uh, still going out to sea. The mills, of course, are a great story uh, on the Merrimack. Here is a shot in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And people, one question people have, are the mills being ref refurbished and improved in places like Lawrence and Lowell and Haverhill? And the answer is yes and no. Um, some of them Many of them are not being used as mills anymore, but they are being used 
and, and quite markedly so, um, as their own center to be a mall. Like this is in Lawrence, and I think you can see a parking garage going up on the right. Uh, in the Lawrence, what used to be mills, there are college classes, there are um, health services, there are restaurants, there are business offices. So Lowell has really filled up almost every square inch of their extra space. Lawrence is improving. And this is a picture of Lawrence. Um, the river is only three to five feet here. And of course, it differs from rain to rain or um, from storm to storm. And um, this is an example of Lawrence being uh, improved in the modern age. The river starts in uh, Franklin, New Hampshire, and here's a uh, photo of the river. I took this. In fact, I started in Franklin, New Hampshire, uh, where the river starts, and over a period of time, went all the way down river, not by boat, but I, I went to every community I could find, and I took photos. This shows just what a gem the Merrimack still is. It probably looks like it did three or 400 years ago. There's white water, there are fish. The river is stocked north of Manchester, New Hampshire. There's good fishing. And it's just a beautiful place to be if you have a kayak or a canoe, or uh, if you're just taking a hike. So in Franklin, New Hampshire is where it starts. Uh, two small rivers come in to meet in Franklin, New Hampshire. That would be the Pemi Stream and the Winnipesaukee River. And those, um, there's no one spot in Franklin that says this is where the Merrimack starts. In fact, I went to a pizza place in Franklin and I said, geez, where does the river start? I want to take a photo if there's a big sign or an etching. And the fellow said, well, you go down to the high school parking lot, walk as far as you can out on the parking lot along the river and look to your left and somewhere down there, the river the two rivers meet and that's where the Merrimack starts. So at the moment, there is uh, not a spot that is easily recognizable, but this is Franklin, New Hampshire, and it shows a start of the Merrimack. And one of the historical elements, of course, of the Merrimack River is the chain bridge. And um, you've, many of you probably uh, passed this sign on the chain bridge in Newburyport. Um, but it, it goes to, and probably many of you have not stopped to read it because I had never read it because obviously I'm driving along and did not take the speed reading course. Um, but this is an example of how old the river is and how far things went back. And it, for those of you listening, it says open to travel in November of 1792. And then it was rebuilt as a suspension bridge in 1810. It was rebuilt again in 1828. It was a toll bridge until 1868. And in 1909, it was built again, rebuilt again by the commissioners of Essex County. And 1909 sticks in my mind because that was the year the state legislature uh, declared that the Merrimack River would be spelled with a K, K at the end of the word Merrimack. Now we know there's a town of Merrimack we know in many communities, there's Merrimack Street spelled with a C. But the legislature uh, in 1909 declared that the Merrimack River would be spelled with a K. So there we are. Here's a wonderful photo of Lowell, Massachusetts. And people ask, you know, are, are the, is the river still used for energy and for mill power and electric power? And the answer is yes. And here you can see several dams and locks. Um, they hold back the water for a given time. So when they need it for electricity for the mills, they can let it go. Uh, there's U UMass Lowell on the right. Um, that's a dormitory. And several listeners to one of my presentations said, you know, this um, scene is very familiar to them because I was standing on a bridge when I took this and they said, we would have to walk across that bridge in winter from one classroom to another and it was freezing cold. But there you are, this is part of the Merrimack River in Lowell. 
Here is a wonderful photo by Brian Eaton. Until recently, he was a photographer with the Daily News in Newburyport. And it demonstrates um, how wildlife is coming back to the Merrimack River. Again, the Merrimack was very polluted through the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Then we got the Clean Water Act in 1972. The water got cleaner, and the fish started coming back, and the eagles started coming back. And now that the river doesn't freeze over as much as it, <coughs> excuse me, as it once did, there are many eagles um, that come along the Merrimack River, and you know they are primarily fishermen and fisherwomen, if you can use that for a for an eagle. Um, they do fishing, and of course, a century or two ago, um, when the Merrimack froze over, that was hard to do. So the eagles went further south. But now that it's warmer, it's cleaner, there are more fish, it's a good time for eagles. And this is uh, just a wonderful shot by photographer Brian Eaton. Here's a beautiful spot in Methuen. And all areas, every community has beautiful areas. And Methuen um, is an urban community, of course, but this just shows how a beautiful uh, sailboat is in the background. Um, this is a public park and a boat launch. And I stopped here because uh, it just shows the beauty of the river and how every community um, is trying to make it a little cleaner. And they're, nowadays they're looking for federal money, um, low interest loan money to help clean the river. This is a wonderful shot um, of the Merrimack River. Uh, it's in the autumn, as I think you can see. I think this is above Amesbury going towards Merrimack and Haverhill. And um, it shows the river running through the North Shore. It also shows um, a growing number of uh, developments and residential areas that have come to the area in recent years. And people say, well, you know, the Merrimack several years ago was named one of the most vulnerable rivers in the country, meaning vulnerable to pollution. And um, it's not fatal, of course, but uh, this national group called American Rivers did signal out um, Newburyport and the Merrimack River as being very um, vulnerable. And one area of vulnerability is the fact that more uh, residential developments are being created and it's taking away uh, marshland, it's taking away fields, it's taking away rivers. And here you can see that actually happening. Um, a lot of the trees have disappeared here and they're condominiums. And then um, it's just one thing that people have to have in mind. The other two elements involved in making Newburyport a vulnerable river and thus um, having its share of pollution is one is CSOs, combined sewage overflows. And this happens when there's a large storm, rainstorm. And in many communities, Haverhill, Lawrence, Lowell, Manchester, New Hampshire, the pipes that pick up storm water from the streets sends the water into the sewage treatment plant where the effluent is being treated. Now, during a drought, that's fine. The rainwater mixes with the effluent, they're both clean and they go back in. But when there are really big storms, there's too much, too much water goes into the sewage treatment plant and it can't handle it. So the whole amount of water is discharged and that's a comp combined sewage overflow. So you're getting millions of gallons of effluent with the millions of gallons of rainwater. And so for a couple of days, we have a very dirty river. Now, recently, state officials passed a regulation that when a sewage treatment plant, such as uh, happens in Haverhill or Lawrence, when they have an overflow, when they do um, let all the sewage into the water, they're going to have to alert people downstream that they've had a discharge. And so probably you shouldn't be swimming and you might want to consider going boating that day or going fishing. But that is a step forward. 
in the past, say Lowell, you know, let a couple million of gallons of effluent and water go, no one downstream would know. I've, I have talked to boaters down at Plum Island and they say, you know, several days later, they can see the effluent, it's not pretty, and I won't go into it, it's a bit scatological. But um, this new regulation, I think, will uh, make uh, sewage plants upstream have to alert those downstream, either from, e either from emails or um, phone calls or signals, but things uh, hopefully will change. Here's a photo of the way things looked in the old days. This is a spigot river in Lawrence. It was a pretty dirty place and yet um, it employed many people. This is the 1890s, I'm thinking. And it's true that the mills created um, bad working conditions and there was child labor, which took advantage of children. There were dirty conditions. On the other hand, and I'm, maybe I'm not too progressive on this, but I remember also that it gave jobs to thousands of people. Now, from the 1850s in Ireland, there was a famine. So many Irish people came. In Poland and Russia, uh, there were persecutions of Jews and many Jewish families came. Uh, Greece and Armenia uh, had political problems and many people came to the North Shore and they got jobs in the mills. And so I've always felt it's a two-edged sword that yes, in the early 20th century, there was significant exploitation of workers which brought about one of the first successful labor strikes in about 1912, the bread and roses strike in Lawrence. But for many years, it provided jobs for individuals. They didn't have to have a car and uh, it got a lot of families started. Here is a, a shot in Lowell, Massachusetts. And people say, um, you know, what were the big industries of the day? Well, of course, it's textiles and wools. In fact, you know, in the say, 30s and years ago, in the 30s, 40s, and before that, um, old timers remembered that the river, parts of it would get orange if, you know, one of the mills was creating orange uh, clothing that day, or it would go purple if purple was being used in the mills. There wasn't much in terms of uh, pollution control, again, until the 1970s. But one other thing, that occurred to me is in addition to making textiles, this area um, must have made a lot of brick. If you've uh, gone past L Lawrence in your car, you've seen enormous brick mills. This is Lowell, many enormous brick mills. So maybe that's one of my uh, goals in the future is to do some research on the brick making industry because it's quite significant and obviously quite large. This is Life Along the Merrimack. I'm Dyke Hendrickson, the host of the podcast. This is 96.3 radio and cable TV, local channel nine in Newburyport. And we're talking about some of the elements of the Merrimack River. And here's a, a water utility, it cleans water so people can drink it. This is in Lowell. And uh, one of the elements that I was um, taken by, intrigued by, is to learn that more than 500,000 people still get their drinking water from the Merrimack. Of course, it's a lot cleaner than it was, but um, half a million people is a lot. So when we consider, gee, why should the river be kept clean? Well, half a million people get their drinking water from it. And I would mention that American Rivers, that organization that said the Merrimack was vulnerable, caution people on the North Shore to make sure that they regulate and officials regulate the chemicals that are going into plants, especially in Southern New Hampshire. There's a lot of building there. Um, new chemicals are being used. And um, because so many people get their drinking water, uh, state and federal officials must continue to regulate and to know what chemicals are used in the new plants and um, how much is going into the river water. The river, we talk about pollution in the Merrimack, but it's still a beautiful spot. This is taken from Hatters Point in Amesbury. That's the 
Maudsley State Park across the river, and it's just a beautiful spot. Now, the river can be bucolic, but sometimes we're looking here at a speedboat, Team Apache it is. I bet there's at least one case of beer uh, under the feet of those four guys <laughs> we're looking at. They make a lot of noise. Um, it wasn't uh, what Henry David Thoreau thought of when he paddled along the river in 1839, but nevertheless, uh, the Merrimack is a playground for a lot of different types. Here's a wonderful shot. And people say, um, you know, what are the beauties of the Merrimack River? And this is certainly one of them. This is upstream from Newburyport. You can see uh, church steeple in the background. You can see scores of vessels. And you can see many of the islands in the lower Merrimack are not inhabited. And as this is the case, uh, it's a beautiful shot of a, one of the islands and uh, some of the vessels in the background. And here is Derek Mitchell. He's an official in Lawrence, Massachusetts. He wrote an essay for my book. He was one of the voyagers. This was a group of 12 to 15 people who in August of 2019 uh, got into kayaks in Franklin, New Hampshire and paddled down to the um, end of the river at Plum Island. And he wrote an essay um, on how valuable it was to him, how they used teamwork, how they worked hard together. And uh, he said it was one of the best experiences of his life. It was four days, 117 miles. And um, they, of course, got out off the river at night and were back on early in the morning. And a lot of people ask, um, what about the old days? What was Newburyport and the Merrimack like? Well, this is 1852. Uh, this is an artistic work by Richard Burke Jones of Newburyport. This shows what the waterfront looked like. Now he is the city clerk in Newburyport, but he's so much more than that, as you can see. He's a historian, he's a wonderful artist. He has let me use this um, in my book. And um, so this shows you the vessels were several hundred feet long. They weighed over 500,000 tons, some of them. And they got so large that they couldn't navigate the shallow river anymore. They could leave the river, you know, with no cargo on a high tide because they were so heavy, but they could not come back with cargo. So when people say, well, why did the shipbuilding era end? In large part, it ended because the ships got too big and with cargo, they just could not get back into the shallow Merrimack. Here's a photo of what it looked like. This is the 1890s. This is a Symington. A wonderful photo. It was a big day when a ship took sail, as you can see. The women in the foreground were dressed up. There's a horse and buggy that brought people down. And there's hundreds of people on the vessel itself. So when Newburyport put a vessel into water, it was a big event. And this is a wonderful shot. I'm glad we included that because at a recent event, someone said, well, what about steamships? Did they ever come? to Newburyport. And here, the Empire State, this is what we're looking at if you're listening on the radio. The Empire State was a steamer. This is an early 20th century. And you, you know, this was before most people had cars of their own. And so it was a big day to walk down to the river. And if there was a vessel there, they, they'd get on. And there's hundreds of people waiting to get on this boat. And it still happens today. Hundreds of people will get on a whale watcher in Newburyport. But Newburyport did not build steamships, and they did not build vessels of steel and iron such as this, because we discussed this. Um, it was too, the river's too shallow. But this vessel did get in on high tide. It went up and down the river as far as it could, again, at high tide. And so it was an exciting moment for when you know, a steamer like this would come into the town and hundreds would want to get on it. And here's a wonderful photo of Joppa Park. This Joppa, as you might know, is that part between downtown Newburyport heading out towards Plum Island. In the old days, there were scores of clam shacks there and many people would get clams and um, mussels and they would 
process than there. There's one residence there that has a sign on it, you know, the old clam shack. But basically, Joppa Park is much different than it once was. Although, you know, people still put in their kayaks. Some people go swimming there. And this is a situation where the city of Newburyport did a very good job in fixing up Joppa Park. And the sign says established 1971. And in recent years, they've, you know, made it more robust with flowers, with lawn, with benches. So this is a real asset to New Report at Joppa Park. The Coast Guard, and we're looking at three Coast Guard vessels, um, has always been a major factor in New Report. And we'll end with this. Um, the birthplace of the Coast Guard is Newburyport. In 1790, Alexander Hamilton was Secretary of the Treasury and went to President George Washington and said, you know, we've just fought a revolution. We don't have any money. And Washington said, essentially, do you have any bright ideas? And Hamilton said, yes, let's start a revenue cutter service. We'll have 12, 10 to 12 small vessels, 60 feet, and we'll have them crewed and We'll go into, we'll stop smuggling along the New England coast, and we'll also uh, board vessels to make sure that these large ships are paying their correct amount of duty. So the Revenue Cutter Service was started in 1790. The first vessel was launched in 1791. That was the Massachusetts. And so because the Massachusetts was built in Newburyport, the birthplace of the Coast Guard is now Massachusetts. And if outliers from Salem or Boston or Annapolis ever say they are the ones, um, this is not true. Lyndon Johnson in 1965 signed a proclamation saying that Newburyport was the birthplace of the Coast Guard. And one last note, the Coast Guard did not have that name until 1915. They were the Revenue Cutter Service. But in 1915, the Revenue Cutter Service merged with the Life Saving Service, which was also founded on the North Shore. So the Coast Guard name started in 1915 with the merger. In 1939, the um, Lighthouse Service joined with those two institutions and also became part of the Coast Guard. So those three services started in 1915 and concluding in 1939, became the Coast Guard. There's still an active Coast Guard presence in New England. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book a couple of years ago, New England Coast Guard Stories. And just this week, you may have seen in the news, the Coast Guard saved a vessel off of Cape Cod, rescued five or six fishermen. And so it's a very vibrant and very valuable service here in New England. So that's some of the questions that I've been asked in recent weeks. I do speak from time to time at different events. And I spoke at the Literary Festival a week or two ago. That was a wonderful time. And um, before that, there were some libraries on the North Shore. And more than 200 people came to that Zoom event. So I say this because the Merrimack is much beloved here on the North Shore. And I look forward to talking on the podcast once again about the Merrimack River. So we're concluding right now. I'm finished. My name is Dyke Hendrickson. The podcast is Life Along the Merrimack. We've been doing it for more than 90 sequences. That's almost two years. And this is, once again, our half hour that we meet and talk about the Merrimack. Next week, we'll be back at 2 o'clock. And so I'm signing off now. 96.3 Joppa Radio, Comcast Cable Channel 9. And we look forward to being with you again. Thank you for being here.